Hey, a pleasure and good day, everybody. Welcome into the next edition of the Royal Take. Is here in this edition of the Royal Take. We are going to cover Kirk McDonald moving on to the Duquesne Fighting Saints and wishing the best of luck there as he already arrived down there. He's now going to get to do what he's really the best at, which is mentoring and growing young players with one of the best junior programs that I believe is 11 straight years uh, made the playoffs in the USHL. So he's definitely getting, it's a huge honor for any coach, let's put it that way in simplest terms, to get a chance to coach the Fighting Saints in the USHL. But Ryan, first and foremost, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be back. Yep. And, uh, of course, you and I were both surprised uh, by Kirk McDonald resigning, but then once I saw the junior team he was taking over, that kind of got rid of my surprise because I saw he was taking over what is basically the Yankees, so to speak, of the USHL. Like 11 straight playoffs, a team that has Johnny Goudreau and other great success stories as alums of their uh, franchise, the Duke came fighting Saints. Uh, I would say... It's a huge honor for somebody. Zygmunt's conversions on a Buffalo, who's recently developed into being a solid fourth liner as a former first-round pick. So they got good alumni, and they are consistently good. No matter what they have to make the NHL, they have consistently good players in the E and in the AHL from that program as well. I think for Kirk, it made sense in the end why he left then, because everybody kind of meets the time where they want another challenge. And I think it was kind of he wanted another challenge, and coaching the junior teams are completely different. Um, out like a completely different day by day basis stuff as you're developing guys to get to the pro levels of the ECHL, AHL, and hopefully NHL. So I think it's a cool thing for him with how good he is with the young kids to get that challenge. I think he kind of just wanted another challenge. That was kind of my takeaway. And, and when your other challenge option is one of the best teams in the USHL, why would you not jump at that opportunity? Absolutely. Yeah. I was, like you said, I was shocked. When I got the news yesterday, I was a little shocked. I was at work and I looked down at my phone and I saw, I'm like, wow. But I didn't think he was going to leave unless he got a job in the AHL. But after hearing what you said, because I didn't do much research on this new team, I see why he took the job. And I wish him nothing but the best. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Dylan Gambrell, who's a guy that's still developing, there's a couple of guys, Riley Barber, who's a good AHL player. Um, so there's other guys there that came from Duquesne. I think Kirk. I always said this about him. He was one of the best, if not the best guy um, in the organization at knowing exactly how to develop his talent. And if you're with the Fighting Saints and their GM, I saw paraphrasing her quotes when I read them last night, talked about how his philosophy aligns with their philosophy perfectly. And I feel like that's because of how much he loves being involved in the process of each player's development. But also, he's one of those new age head coaches that combines old school me uh, methodolo methodologies as well, uh, where he likes being around the players away from the rink to make sure they know that he's also a person and not just their boss, quote unquote. Like he wants to make sure they know, oh, I'm here for you no matter what, not just on the rink. And he was, I thought, very good with that in Reading. I think having that amongst young players is going to help them mature even quicker. So I feel like he's going to be perfect there. Uh, it's hats off and congratulations uh, to him for getting that opportunity. And speaking about coaching, uh, University of Massachusetts alum uh, Jacob Pritchard uh, is going to become a volunteer assistant coach as he decides to hang up the skates uh, for his playing career and become a coach out there in his uh, alma mater. As obviously, as the Royals said, we wish uh, Pritchard the best of luck. And I feel like he was one of – you kind of talked about Luca being soft-spoken. I feel like Pritch fits into the category of being a soft-spoken, intelligent, out-of-the-wazoo hockey player, which also could fit into a head coach because you're probably going to be one of those calm, explained guys. Like, I would assume Luca is more – I doubt Luca is one of those guys just like <laughs> – because that wouldn't really go with what he was as a player, but maybe he is. Uh, so I feel like Pritch can kind of be – one of those types of head coaches, similar to the elk, how you talked about before we started the podcast, how Luke was a, was a calm, kind of soft-spoken presence as a player, which I agree with. Pritch fits into that category. He's also an intelligently, Kirk always talked about it, how smart he was on the ice. Did he have the sexiest finish compared to the start of the season? No, but that happens for other players. It's not the first guy to ever do that. I think he's going to have a good opportunity to be a good head coach going forward. And UMass ain't no joke of a program. So the fact that you're starting with uh, 
UMass to get to uh, have your chance there to uh, be the volunteer head coach. You're starting with a very good program there as well, so that he gets to be welcomed back into. So that's kind of my takeaway from that. Yeah. Like, I like Richard as a player, but he had his spurts where some games he looked good, some games he looked eh. I'm looking at his numbers now. 52 points in 58 games, so he almost averaged a point a game. And, of course, we don't have his rights. We didn't have his rights anymore. We traded him to Cincinnati, which we'll talk about later. So, again, he's our guy. I wish nothing but the best, too. Yeah, we ended up moving him to Cincinnati. I doubt he play well. So I feel like, like I said, he's hanging up the skate because it would be weird to be playing for an ECHL team while being the assistant coach for a college team, even if you are a volunteer. But maybe if there, if there's some way you're able to do that, you still will. But we'll see. But um, head coach Greg Carville um, on Jacob Pritchard returning to UMass said, I'm very excited to bring Jake back into our program as our volunteer coach for the upcoming season. I've known Pritch for a very long time and have had the privilege of coaching him for two different schools. He played a pivotal role on our 18-19 team that played for the national championship, having led that team in scoring and serving as a role model on our very young and inexperienced team. Pritch was a leader on that team and will serve in a similar role next season. He's one of the most skilled and gifted players I have coached, and he will do a great job helping to develop our players while reinforcing the strength of our co- uh, of our culture. That is head coach Greg Garvel of UMass on Jacob Pritchard returning to UMass to be the head coach. Um, I also think Pritchard, he was noticeably injured in the season. And he yes. Was, so I think that factored into how he was able to round out the season, but all in all, I thought he had a good season. It's just injuries screwed him in the end, and that happens sometimes. But he, he did trade his rights to Cincinnati. I feel like if he's coaching, he's probably not going to also play for Cincinnati, but we'll see what happens uh, going forward when it comes to that side of the boat. But now we'll move on to somebody that completed the trade um, for future considerations with the uh, Wooster Railers, who, as Ryan informed me of before the podcast, actually happened to score his first goal against none other than our Reading Royals, which is Max Newton, which has a really cool flowing name. Uh, yeah. So hopefully his uh, production can be as good as that. Uh, he played at Alaska Fairbanks in the WCHA, improved upon his play each season there, and then at Murray Mack in the Hockey East, which is a little above the WCHA, I would say. Uh, he was able to do really well there and be above a points for game player. He's a guy that is definitely – uh, from looking at his numbers, seems to be a very good pass first player and a guy from reading all the different stuff I was able to gather on before doing this podcast, from the little bit you are able to find on someone that played in colleges like that. It, it, they describe him kind of as a pass first with a good shot. So obviously the Royals, they have a lot of guys. You would consider even Pritch a guy as a, that's a good shot, but a guy that's a pass first player. So if you're able to develop him into something that's even remotely close to that, uh, eight points in 13 games, three goals, five assists. That's obviously a good start. So if you're able to continue to progress that, one uh, Apple with the Providence Bruins in two games. So I think he's a good pickup. He's somebody you can't know exactly where his pro career is yet because he only played 15 total games between the E and the AHL. But I think this is also a grab that how the Flyers – grab the Hodgson's and the Wilmans of the world thinking maybe there's a diamond in the rough here. I feel like Newton might be one of those guys just because he's younger. He already had two AHL games and played good in them to have an assist already in the AHL only playing 13 ECHL games. So I f- and playing in colleges that are signed to the most bombastic colleges, Merrimack and Alaska Fairbanks. So I think he's progressing fairly quickly for himself. I feel like this is a guy we might see play a couple games with the Phantoms next year, too, if he does have a good – like, if he starts to say the first 25 well, I wouldn't be surprised if he's definitely a guy that the Phantoms, especially with how I think the Phantoms, if they're smart, will go younger next year and have uh, more of a young infusion. I feel like the Phantoms would be smart to uh, call him up if he has a good start. Well, obviously, the next guy we'll talk about, he's also going to fit into that category, but Newton – uh, I think will as well. I don't know. Obviously, I know you didn't have as much background on him, but I would think at least adding as many good forwards with potential as you can is obviously a very good offseason uh, move to do. Yeah, I don't, like you said, I didn't do much in research on Newton, but I think if he signs with the team, I think he would be a good player to fit in with um, if we sign him. Logan Connolly, I think those two will mesh pretty well together. 
Connolly's more of a scoring guy, and Newton, as you said, is a pass first. So those two could get some good chemistry going if they're both on the team next year. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think somebody like that matching them up with uh, guys that can just kind of fire that uh, biscuit in the net would be the best case scenario. Oh, uh, we're now going to move to somebody we got from Luco's team, coach from a Reading Royal to the Reading Royals, uh, is Ben Howichuk. Um If you recognize his name, you should recognize his name. Uh, and uh, he played for Brampton last year and had, let's see here, three points in a uh, 14 games and then went off this year and had 18 goals and 17 assists and 35 points while almost having 120 penalty minutes. He also was very good in the playoffs with four points in seven games. Uh, he's a guy that's 5'11", 186, but plays like he's about 6'4", 230. So um, he's definitely a guy that I think the Reading faithful are going to adore and admire. Now that Trevor Gooch is gone, I wouldn't be surprised if we come up with some chant for Ben Howitruck by game 36 with the <laughs> Uh, season I accept I, I accept I expect him to play I should say because the way he's progressed New Brunswick is also a very good college in the AUS and then the OHL Barry's a fantastic team he played very good with Barry beat the living crap out of anybody that stood up for his team there in terms of what you were allowed to do in the juniors obviously and then he also progressed his goal scoring more and more each year 27 and 23 that's a great final year in the AUS he only played 13 games with New Brunswick but did still have eight points in that and 16 penalty minutes. And then he's progressed very well in the ECHL. This kind of, to me, seems like it's going to be that full. This seems like it's the year you're going to get. And it will be. it's nice that if they can sign him and lock him up, it's going to be with our Royals. This is the year you're going to get that full exploding season by Howard Chuck. So that's why I'm also exceptionally excited about this pickup because it seems like you have an ECHL star. And just like we said with Newton, probably even more so with Howard Chuck, he definitely, I think, will see time with the Phantoms this year. I would be shocked if he doesn't with the way he's progressing. Yeah, and like you said earlier, almost 120 penalty minutes. That's something the Royals could use, some kind of physicality, as that hurt us in the series against Newfoundland. Someone to watch after guys like Johnstone, Skirving, Melindy, just to name a few. Yeah, I also love how when you look at certain guys, the, the fighters tend to always look like the happiest guy. Sometimes in pictures yeah. like Ben Howard's smile looks like the happiest man. Meanwhile, he probably just, before taking that picture, fought somebody to death on the ice. Uh, but, <laughs> the, uh, but no, I think uh, other guys we have to wish uh, good luck to is uh, Trevor Gooch decided to go to Germany Gooch. after having a great season. Yeah, Gooch, which I think was unfortunate but expected when you dominate like that. You're gonna if you have if you have an offer from a pro league, why the hell not? Like, why yeah. would you not take it if you have an offer from? And you get to experience. He might be thinking along because I know I would be thinking, oh, I get to experience a cool new culture too in Germany, yeah. and I like those types of experiences too. So I feel like two and two put together. That's kind of what led him to that decision. And then when it comes to Grant Cooper, he was moved to Carolina for the future considerations involved in that trade back on February twenty second. I liked Cooper a lot because I thought he was a perfect role player that's going to develop into more. I think he's what he's going to become for South Carolina. He's going to become one of the league's defensive stalwarts over time where the Royals could have used that. But you can also more easily find defensive stalwarts than a guy like Howard Chuck and maybe a guy like Newton that's going to develop into an offensive stalwart over time. I feel like the defensive steady guys, the Royals have been very good at finding so I feel like they're going to continue to be good at finding that. Like, for example, if you keep Cressy, I thought most of the season Cressy was actually a pretty good face of a defensive guy then later in the season because it seemed like the grueling first pro season, once you got to that game total you were not used to playing over, he kind of wore down a bit. He's actually a player I would like to keep just on a keep list because I feel like if you over judge somebody based off of their wear down in their rookie season, that's a bad move as an organization. So I feel like you should keep him because he was in the right direction and he seems to be still trending in the right direction. It's just certain guys wear down in the first rookie season because they're not used to playing 76 games. So it happens, but the guy I know you and I are the most sad, um, that ended up going to complete the one trade that was made all the way back in December of 2021. Um, <laughs> wow. so long ago. Uh, which was with Norfolk. Um, that was Kenny Hausinger. I loved Kenny Hausinger. I loved the way the kid played the game. He was only about 5'9", 5'10". Uh, played 
going to the hard spots in front of the net, getting bashed around and not caring, getting right back up, still deflecting the puck. He was good in front of the net with the deflection, too. Um, he's going to fit in well with Norfolk because we played Norfolk, obviously, a bit. And the, one of their biggest issues, I thought, was they, they, they played a scrappy game and could get in front of the net, but they did not have anybody that was perfect in front of the net in terms of you would never see – great deflections from the Admiral. So adding in Kenny Hausinger, I think, honestly, is going to fit pretty well into their program because they have a lot of guys that can take the goaltender's eyes away. They're just not the best with the stick in terms of the deflections. Kenny's one of his best attributes, I would say, is getting in front of the net and deflecting that thing in. So I think he's going to fit well there. We wish him all the best. But he's the, he's honestly, because Gooch I saw leaving, so I think I that tempered my, like, heartache for that he's the guy i was the most broken to see lee because i think he's going to develop into a very good player in this league yeah like you said i saw gooch leaving too i was hoping the fans would pick him up so he would stay in the system but obviously that wasn't the case and like you said losing housing is going to hurt he had a really good series against maine and then he cooled off in the series against newfoundland but now he's with his reunite with his rudder christian in norfolk so hopefully the two get to play well together and maybe who knows maybe the third brother camps with them yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's with Christian and North Christian, and also when he came over the latest, uh, Cam and Kenny, Cam the most, Kenny the second most, and then Christian the least amount of experience. But um, he started playing really well, too. I really liked uh, what I was able to see uh, from him, especially the one game that I was up in the booth with Eric doing uh, to see from a different perspective. It is going to be cool getting the brotherly uh, vibes there too. So that's a good that's a good additionary point as well. So yeah, it's definitely going to be fun to watch. I mean, that's what I kind of love about covering these sports too, because like Kirk McDonald, now I'm going to pay much more attention to the Fighting Saints next year. I like watching the USHL, but I don't watch it heavily. But I watch different games here and there when I want to pay attention to prospects. Well, now because Kirk, I have to definitely pay more attention to them. And the different teams that these guys left to uh, definitely keep more tabs on Norfolk, especially because that's a cool storyline, as you brought up uh, with the brothers stuff. So that's just a cool uh, storyline to follow on top of anything else. So I think that's the cool thing with sports, too. I'm one of those people you see the TikToks and stuff sometimes too that say, like, to the people, other hockey fans, I'm a fan first and foremost of these teams, but I'm also just a fan of the overall sport. I think that's the way I tend to try to look at things because then you get less pissed off than most people too. So like, if you look at things that way, you're not one of those people. That's yeah. And then like, literally start drinking seven tequila shots. And before you know it, you're on the floor somewhere. Uh, so like, I think uh, being in the realm of, just kind of taking it as it goes with, and uh, like I loved this uh, Kelly Cup with uh, the Everblades. Uh, it was a really good Kelly Cup. I think it proved how much of an under talked about goaltender Johnson was, which yeah. I said that on a couple of past videos that I did on the Kelly Cup, and then didn't have as much time recently with stuff I'm doing with music and other stuff. But I am still gonna I'm about to do a video and release a video, I should say, on the Everblades by the end of the night, but. It, it, it comes down to goaltending, and I think that's the point I wanted to get to next. With them, Cam Johnson continued to get better and better as the season went on. With the uh, Royals, we obviously have Logan Flodell, if you want to keep Hawkey, who was a back, uh, he was kind of the straight up backup this year, yeah. where, but he can develop into more than that. And then if you keep Nagel in organization, he might end up starting with the Royals, which I would think they're going to try to keep him in the organization if he wants to keep playing because it would be stupid not to if he wants to keep playing because he's a perfect uh, veteran goalie that's a great leader but like Kirk I remember saying before we put a C on Pat if he was able to do that so mm -hmm. like that just goes to show uh, how great of a leader he is but I would say our goaltender is in a pretty good spot because yes Flodell in the playoffs showed some rebound bugaboos but it's also his first playoffs after playing only 19 games in the league so to, to think that wouldn't happen, I think, would have been more naive than to actually not be annoyed that it did happen. So, like, that's why, like, for me, that was kind of expected. The team still played well around him. Pat came in, had a solid playoffs. He even himself, I think, would admit some of those games he would like to have uh, a couple back. But uh, I think when it comes to our goaltending, if you keep Pat around, if you have Flo and you have Hawkey, and you're obviously going to add more guys if Hanson stays in organization too, I thought he's a pretty damn good goaltender as well. Uh, 
I think you're pretty good at net, especially at the ECHL level, because you're going to have those guys down. Um, and I think especially if you have Hanson and Flodell, that's why I want to keep Hanson in the organization, because then you have two really good young guys that I think are starter levels in Hanson and Flodell. And then Hawkey, I think, has the potential to be a 1B given time. But right now he's just a steady, like the straight up Lauren Brousseau of like the ECHL, like just a backup. Yeah, for sure. And also keep an eye out. I know we talked about it before, you and I, Chris Domenko's coming back from injury. Samuel Erson's coming back from injury. There's a good chance we could see them down here to begin next season. Yeah, Erson, I think by default, might not be down just because that depends what Sandy's going to do. Like, I feel like they might need him with the Phantoms because Sam Samson's an unrestricted, so Sandstrom gets offered a contract by a team that doesn't say have as much goaltenders. He might decide to jump ship and go there because they'll go, oh, well, I don't have to. I don't have Ivan Fedotov. I don't have Sammy. I don't have all these other guys that are coming up behind the pipe, like the Kozilov kid uh, that they drafted that's doing really well. So I, it's, I think Ursan, I agree with Usti. If Usti resigns, which I hope he does because I love Usti, I have his bobblehead right over there next to Jonathan Quick. Um, oh, nice. But the. If he resigns, I agree with that before Hartley. He should be, he's going to probably be in running to start the season and develop up from there. What to, I think, be the backup for Ursan given time if uh, Sandstrom does not resign. If Sandstrom does resign, then you're going to probably have the Swedish duo in Lehigh. And then Usti's just going to kind of be by default, no matter how well he does, stuck playing with the Royals, which is a good thing for us, but not necessarily great for him. So, uh, like, it's going to be interesting to see how the goaltending carousel with the Flyers kind of plays are going forward. But I do like our goaltending no matter what. Uh, and if Usti's in there, hopefully, because he's one of the best ECHL goalies, then that would be very helpful. If Sammy's down, that's also going to be very helpful because when healthy, he already shows signs in the AHL. So, yeah, all in all, I'm pretty happy with the goaltending. And all in all, lately, with the Flyers organization as a whole, one of the things I can compliment them actually on the bit, which is something I never thought I would say seven to ten years ago in my life, is goaltending. All of a sudden, when Ron Hextall came in and they haven't stopped with Brett Flair, they got decent at drafting goaltending. So it's nice to see that uh, because before it was like hitting your head against a brick wall to try to get this team to figure out what the heck they were doing in net when it came to drafting somebody. So I feel like the Flyers are set for the future now. Ursan. I, he had one injury plug season, so I'm not as overly concerned about that as uh, some other people are. But I feel like if he comes back, stays healthy, if Samstrom hopefully stays, that makes us even better. But even if we just have Usti, if we have Ursan and we have the kids like Hanson developing Flodell, one of those kids might end up becoming, I think at least one will end up becoming an AHL goaltender. So then you still have that developing up over time. Then for your AHL team, and then you're going to have Ursan probably organically either get traded to, to be an NHL goalie or end up being an NHL goalie for your team at some point. So I think they're set up in a good spot for goaltender wise. I, I don't I don't worry about that uh, whatsoever, especially because I think that Kozlov's kid's doing really well. And even Tomic, who usually plays for the uh, Czech Republic, or he might be Slovak- Slovakia, he usually plays for Slovakia in the world. He's actually been pretty good overseas. It's just the Flyers don't need him, so they never. Yeah. He's still. He's like for Dotov, you reserve his rights because he plays for an overseas league. But if you sign him, he's basically not going to go go anywhere. Like he's kind of in that Kirill Vujmelka category, probably. But if we sign him, we don't necessarily need him. Well, I could see a team like the Sharks maybe trying to pry him, pry him up from the league and get him. But uh, we'll have to see what happens with him. But all in all. I think the Royals are still set for success next year. It's just going to depend what their head coach uh, direction takes them because I'm interested to see with the guys they added, um, what what play style they kind of bring in with this new head coach. If it's more of what some people call for, the a little bit more of the grit and the grind <laughs> than the just North style defense moving to offense that Kirk had. Or if it's going to be still most of that North style, but you mix in more of the Howachucks, so you just naturally get more of the grit and the grind. Because if you re-sign Brennan and have Howachuck, you're just going to naturally, obviously, get more of that grit and grind play. So uh, I would say, I don't know what one of your most interesting things is going into next season, but I would say that's one of mine to figure out when we get the coach, like what the heck the system's going to be with the style of players we now have. 
Yeah, I'm hoping we get somebody that's grit and grind because that really hurt us in the series against Newfoundland. You saw us get beat up left and right. I'm also hoping whoever it is, hopefully he brings a good special teams. Our penalty kill was uh, killing us all year. I don't remember yeah. in front of me, but it was bad. No, our PK was, our power play was, sorry, our PK was a spurty. That's kind of what the issue was. Like, if you looked at the overall numbers, it didn't look bad. So, like, that was one of those things where the stats were, at times, when you looked at the PK month to month, deceiving because the overall average, I think, ended up becoming a 70-something. So, like, overall, that's not terrible when you look at the overall numbers. But when you watched every game, there was a lot of gaps, and even when you would ask players about it, that was one of the things they wanted to improve upon. Where the power play, and I think adding guys like Howard, Chuck, and Newton are just going to help with that. The power play is something that I'm interested to see, um, especially if Conley stays and him continue to progress, as you said, as a scorer, how they're going to grow that and who's kind of going to mix into the power play next season because – I feel like they have to keep that as well as making the penalty kill a strength. Like you said, you can't lose the power play because then that doesn't help you either. If your penalty kill all of a sudden with the new head coach becomes a strength, but the new head coach isn't aggressive enough on the power play. Well, just like this year, it's just going to balance itself out in the opposite direction. So you have to uh, be able to kind of get it both ways. And that's what I'm interested in seeing with the next head coach, someone who kind of knows how to get it both ways, but to wrap up this podcast, you already kind of said yours with Kevin Conley. I said mine. I think Cressy, if you're able to keep him with how he develops, you got to keep him. Another guy, obviously, you must, must, must keep on the team. And if you don't, I don't know what the hell you're doing. Is Patrick Bicol. Yes. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if, if, if you don't keep Patrick Bicol on the team, I don't know what. Like, like there must have been the best thing you could ever smoke that that person did that made that decision. Uh, but because I don't know what you're thinking of. But I don't know if you had anybody that kind of stood out to you. Because with this team, there's a lot of guys. Millie, I don't think, will be with us next year personally. No. I feel like he'll be, he'll be with the Phantoms. And Kirk did say in the last time I had a chance to interview him on the game, he did say Will McKinnon is going to be signed to an AHL contract. So whether he's with the Royals or not will remain to be seen if he makes the Phantoms out of the gate. But who's somebody – uh, for you that you definitely want to have on your stay list for sure. Or a couple guys. You can name as many yeah. as you want. Yeah, Bicon for sure. Whether it's, he's on with a deal for us or an HL deal with the fans, this is definitely one. Another one I'm looking at his numbers right now, Dominic Cormier. I like how he played this yep. year. 16 goals from the blue line. I'll take that again next year. Oh, heck yeah. Cormier also, what I'd love to come him on is there's not a lot of guys, especially at the lower levels, um, that are able to be the CNI shooters from the point like Klingberg is in the NHL with Dallas that for somehow, and I asked Kirk about this before, and he talked about how he learned how to just not throw the puck on aimlessly and wait for there to be a lot of traffic. And by doing that, the, um, I guess he kind of was able to learn how to get it through traffic because he was one of the most flawless guys at not hitting a shin pad. Like there could be four guys in front of the net and somehow he got it on the goaltender when there was no gap whatsoever, but like a Tom Brady pass gap to Wes Welker or something like that. So like, I feel like that's something I've loved from him. If Cockrell wants to keep playing, he's one of the best veteran defensemen in the league. So obviously I would keep him around McNally from what a couple of the guys said about him being like their best friend and everything. Like that's what, uh, um, I'm trying to remember who actually said that quote, but oh, Mo, I think it was Mo. I think Mo said about him. It seemed like he at least is at least pondering retiring from that quote. Like, oh, well, we don't. He might not even play hockey much longer, and he's one of my best friends. That's kind of what I got from that. But Mo's another guy. Obviously, you have to keep going to the, ne- the next season too. I would think he might be on an age. He already was on an AHL deal, so I would think he would stay on an AHL deal. But he's definitely a guy. I would say you have to keep around to continue developing, but. Yeah, I agree with you. It de- definitely hands down. You got to keep, uh, you got to keep Dominic Cormier. Another guy, though, I know both of us like Tim too. He's had games with the Phantoms, so he might end up being with the Phantoms a little bit too. But let me know if you agree with this one. I would say McFadden. We should keep him to keep yes. with because of how important he is for the organization, not just the Royals. Yes, I agree. Like we talked about before, McFadden. I think K. Mackie even said too. McFadden was one of our best 
PK players. So having somebody to can groom younger guys, whether he be on an ECHL deal or HL deal, would be nice to have. Yeah, I completely agree with that. But I think uh, here we've had a pretty good 30 minutes. We talked about the goaltending. We talked about the defense. We talked about the forward core. We talked about K-Mac moving on to the Fighting Saints. Congratulations to him and Cooper and Pritchard and uh, everybody else moving on to their respective new teams, either as head coaches or players. So it was nice to get to kind of wrap this all into one cool 30-minute show with you, Ryan. I thank you for joining again. If you have anywhere you want to – um, suggest for people to follow. I'll just turn it over to you now. Um, th- well, again, thank you for having me on. It was a blast. And of course, follow me on Twitter at Ryan Bizarro. That's I tweet a lot about the Royals during the off season. So join in on the fun. Yeah, yeah, he tweets a lot of cool stats. Definitely give Ryan a follow. You can follow me on Twitter at JJ Borg twenty six, uh, Borg six seven eight nine on Instagram, and then obviously Facebook. Just search my name and it'll come up. Uh. Thanks for following and thanks for watching, everybody. Please continue to subscribe down below to keep the channel growing. This has been the latest edition of the Royal Take. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of the off